Welcome to The Solar Coaster, a podcast about the ups and downs of the Australian solar industry, brought to you by the technical team at Supply Partners, with host Wade Allen and technical guru Andrew Thompson. Okay, welcome to The Solar Coaster podcast, brought to you by Supply Partners, Australia's technical distributor. We bring you sales and technical support so that you can stay current and up to date and hopefully keep you in the cart and on the rails of this exciting and exhilarating ride we call the Australian solar industry. I am your host, Wade Allen, and with me as always, our in-house technical guru, Andrew Thompson, AT, how are you doing, bud? Uh, doing well, thank you. Excellent, are you excited as I am? Ah, uh, honestly, um, not to disparage our other guests, <laughs> but this is probably our most important <laughs> guest so far, so uh, very excited. Yes, so right into that. Today we are delighted to have one of Australia's greatest advocates for our renewable energy industry in-house. He is the current Chief Executive of the Smart Energy Council, our conduit between the industry and the boots and the ground and the policy makers, Mr. John Grimes. John, thank you for being here. Wade, Andrew, fantastic to be here today. <laughs> Excellent. Well, most of you listening would probably know John, but we love to do a little background here, and I'd love to know how John got into this whole industry uh, right from the get-go. So with your background, how did it all come about? Where? So let's just go right back to the roots. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Wow, that's interesting. I was born in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Oh, You're wow. kidding. No. So uh, there, there were people that were being encountered at that time that had never seen white people before. <laughs> they ran away in fear because they thought that we were ghosts. Oh, wow. Um, so a little, wow. a little mission hospital. The day I was born, uh, there'd been a tribal fight and there were dead involved. And so the, the, the villagers all came out and they were wailing and weeping for the, for the dead. And so the doctor went out as my mother's giving birth to me, waved a broom around his head. He's like, rousem, rousem, like to shoo them away so that she could actually get some peace. And oh uh, uh, she, she also tells the story as a, as a baby, right, that, that all the Marys, right, the women from the village came in mm. and they pad in, you know, in feet that have never been washed. And they holding wow. me and she's like, yeah, that's great, hold John the baby. And then one of them has her breast. She's like, flap, 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 as if to say, can I feed the baby? Oh, wow. And that was a step too far for my mother. So yeah, she yeah. said, maybe not that, you know. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was my entry into the world. That's where it all began. So, what brought your parents to the highlands of Papua New Guinea? Well, actually, my, my father was a teacher. So it was like a, a teaching post. Mm. Um, but uh, he was also had been involved in, in the trade union movement, particularly in the, the teaching association in the Northern Territory. And then he went on to hand the teaching unit, union of, of, of Papua New Guinea across to Papua New Guineans mm -hmm. in advance of independence. Independence was 1975. So in advance of that, okay. that was the work that he was doing. So uh, That's fantastic. How long were you there for? Uh, only for a couple of years, until I was about three years old, then moved to Darwin and we got yeah. blown out by Cyclone Tracy. Wow. It's one of those times I remember being in the bathroom, mm -hmm. the, the roof had gone from the house. So they say go to the bathroom, the smallest room in the in, in the house. Yeah. The, the 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 wall had fallen in, and it was plasterboard, but it was sodden because of the tropical rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're all huddled in underneath, and we were praying that we would all be killed together. Oh, oh wow! Like it was not it was not a question of will we survive? Yeah. Because it just seemed inconceivable. Mm -hmm. But you know that that was the thing. So four years old, very vivid memories of that time. I remember waking up, looking across, and being able to see three kilometres, four kilometres to the to the shopping centre that previously you couldn't see mm, because of mm. all the houses and the trees and everything. Yeah. And then in the next couple of days, of course, the water was cut off. There was no food. We were scounging around. We found Christmas presents, mm. three, four, five doors up. Um, and actually one of those I still have, uh, oh, a, wow. a, 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 a cloth snake, oh. uh, uh, which is uh, a reminder of that time. So we, we lost everything. We were refugees in our own country, yeah. mm. displaced. And we actually went to uh, – my father got a job on Christmas Island. Uh, and so I moved as a, as a four-year-old to Christmas mm. Island, which is actually a tropical paradise. <laughs> People only think about it as being a, a detention centre these days. Yeah. But it is actually the, one of the world's num, you know, wonders when it comes to, to, to nature. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so grew up on Christmas Island. And my, and my father at that time went back to teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it, was a seg it was basically apartheid in Australia. So there was the, the Asian workers mm -hmm. and the British 
owners. Mm -hmm. And so there was an Asian swimming pool and a white swimming pool. This is Australia mid-1970s. Wow. Right? And so, so the workers, they're basically indentured labour. They come across, they get a big debt to come and work on the island and they'd have to work it off for years. So in the middle of the night, knock on the door to my father saying, Mr. Grimes, we, we know you know something about, about starting a union. Can you help us start a union mm -hmm. here? And that was the Union of Christmas Island Workers. So yeah, yeah. Uh, really a, amazing history and story. Then, then to Perth, then to Adelaide, grew up and went to uni in Adelaide. And then I was posted, actually, I joined the Air Force. So I spent a decade in the Air Force, posted to um, RAF Base Amberley, which is in Ipswich outside of Brisbane. So mm -hmm. I, was a, I was a Queenslander for all of a year, <laughs> yeah. uh, but gave me a good, a good taste of what Queensland was all about. Uh, and then, uh, then moved to Canberra, been there ever since. So, mm -hmm. so 10 years in the Air Force. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did a degree at university, uh, 10 years in the Air Force. I then joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Do you get a degree in the Air Force or did you do that previously? This is, this is the biggest lark ever. So, yeah. so they actually, they sponsor you to do your degree. Now you can yeah. either go to Duntroon and those places where it's sort of military college, mm -hmm. or they sponsor you at a civilian university. So I had long hair. I was the only bloke at the bar <laughs> with any money, right? <laughs> and so I had a full-time job while I was studying uh, awesome. to finish my degree at Flinders University in Adelaide. Mm. And, uh, and it was, fan and, and a guaranteed job, right? So I came out. And so I found myself at, at age 23, Walking onto a floor, I was in charge of 75 people. Um, so most of them were way older than me, had kids and families. And so as a young officer, you know, to kind of to do yeah. that, I was quickly promoted to a position where actually a year or so later, I had 430 tri-service uh, military people reporting to me. So it was, uh, it was exhilarating. It was, it was, a, it was a, uh, a masterclass in wow. management and leadership mm. and organisational um, it's, it's, uh, it was a great start for At me. At such a young age, too. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. Yep. I would like to know what level of security you've gotten to. Well, um, <laughs> How top secret uh, yeah, are yeah, you? Well, they, 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 uh, I got to the highest level. So, Did you? So it's, it's what, what's called a top secret. It's called a positive vet. And this is where actually a team of people spend six months, sometimes a year, going back and actually testing every part of your history and doing a reference and character check, you know, for all of the things that you could potentially be compromised on, yeah. basically. So, uh, uh, so very, very detailed. And I have a huge amount of respect for, the, for those people. We, you know, we, we do a great job in Australia. We are saying mm -hmm. earlier... The people keep us safe and we don't know about it, and that's a really good thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and to see that world has, has been fabulous. And so from the Air Force, then you said you went into foreign affairs. Foreign right? affairs and trade. I became a diplomat uh, and I served uh, – I was a deputy chief negotiator on Bougainville. So there was a civil war in, in mm -hmm. Bougainville, you might recall, in Papua New Guinea. No, uh, so I, I was the, the, the deputy chief negotiator as part of a peace monitoring group to go and actually restore peace there. Is this like late 90s? Or? It is, late 90s, yeah. 1999. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, I was then uh, – did short-term assignments in Japan and India and then a long-term posting in Burma. Mm -hmm. So Myanmar – Wow. So I was, uh, I was the Australian Embassy. I was a political officer in the Australian Embassy in, in, in Myanmar. Absolutely fantastic. So this is a time where Burma was completely close to the world. Um, and it was, it was so amazing because people wore traditional dress, not because they were doing it for the tourists, yeah. because what, that's what they wore, right? Yeah, right. No advertising, you know, the, the world. But also very sad because the opportunities of the world – hadn't reached the people, right? So a yeah. uh, contrast of things. So when was it, John, that you made the move to solar and why? So I, I, um, I founded a technology business. We took from startup to listing on the stock exchange. I exited that mm -hmm. um, and then started an environmental company. And I was in the water oh, yeah. purification industry. Okay. This is the great millennial drought, if you remember. Yeah, you know, two minute sort of showers. 2005, yeah. 2006, 2007, that time yeah. where we ran out of water. Uh, and so we commercialised this technology that took grey water from baths, showers, washing machines, and turn it into distilled quality water, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you could use water more than once. So that kind of turned me on to the environmental thing. Mm. In 2008, of course, there'd been the global financial crisis. So yeah. we, I employed over 30 people. We were manufacturing. We were selling in China, in the US, in the Middle East, and in Australia. But we weren't profitable yet, right? We were a startup company. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the capital market evaporated overnight. Yep. Mm. And so uh, there was an organisation called the Australian New Zealand Solar Energy Society. Okay. And they were advertising for a part-time CEO. I said, fantastic, I'll do that a couple of days a week, 
go on some boards, maybe do some consulting. I'd done mm. the innovation and startup thing. So I knew a lot about building business mm -hmm. um, and technology. And, and so I applied and, and, and I got the job. That organisation today is the Smart Energy Council. Wow. Oh, wow. That, that organisation traces its history back to 1954, one of the oldest renewable energy organisations in the world. Mm. Um, and uh, and uh, th these were the scientists, people from CSIRO, UNSW, uh, James mm. Cook University, that invented solar technology. Yeah. You know, um, mm. you know, hot water, uh, evacuated tube hot water, concentrated solar thermal, solar PV. Mm -hmm. So, so I was right at home. Two thousand and eight, I joined, uh, and and I saw the projections. Okay, sixteen I went, years. I, I went to the, wow. the the conference in Sydney, and I saw uh, our you know professors talking about the cost curve for solar PV. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is going to take over the world. Yeah. Right? There's no other place you'd rather be. This is the industry that's going to change yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, that's exactly what's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really, you know, um, fighting for the industry and, of course, the whole political story <laughs> after that. So it's been it's – been, look, I, I've been so blessed yeah. to, to have had a, a fantastic career uh, and particularly to have worked in this industry. is absolutely fantastic. When I first joined Supply Partners about four and a bit years ago, mm -hmm. didn't even know what the Smart Energy Council was um, – and my experience with you and your and the Smart Energy Council to date has been, it's been interesting. It's an extremely positive one because I always feel like when something's about to derail the industry, hmm. we bring it up with you. You guys do your thing, and we and there's a solution on the other end of it. So I, I feel like it's you're just so important to the industry because you are, like I said, that conduit between the boots on the ground, and even us, mm. and the, the policymakers. Uh, the focus, I've had a relentless focus on action, right? If, if there's a problem, fix it. Do whatever it takes. Yeah. Pick up the phone. Advocate. If you need to call the troops out and, and, and stage a big protest in the front of, of, of Parliament House in Victoria because they've completely stuffed up their rebate scheme, mm -hmm. well, that's what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, I actually met a, a, a political leader. He was, he was the leader of the opposition, so the Liberal Party leader from New South Wales, 2012, 2013. He sat me down and he said, John, political parties are organised crime. He said, and if you can't hurt them, you don't matter. Right. And never a truer word has been spoken, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. If you are not potent, if you are, are wishy-washy, huge, you know, um, you know uh, 50 page reports on something, never actually saying anything, yeah. really saying anything, not doing mm. anything, they will steamroll over the top of you, Correct. right? Mm. But the flip side of that is call out those that oppose our industry, yeah. but back in those that support our industry, right? Because mm. a lot of good work that happens mm. and they don't get a pat on the back. If they don't get a pat on the back, they're not going to keep doing it, you know? Yeah. So, And I don't care who it is. I've stood alongside Clive Palmer, mm -hmm. Palmer United Party with the big yellow background and <laughs> done a press conference with Clive Palmer mm. because their vote in the Senate saved arena it saved the wow. cefc credit where credit's due i don't care I, i'm right. about the industry i'm about the transition yeah mm -hmm. whoever is on that is on that journey look at matt Keane in new south wales he was a new south wales energy minister a liberal right yeah. mm -hmm. i was very pleased to help even fundraise for him right mm -hmm. to help him out right anything mm -hmm. to actually help him uh, advance so it's not about it's not a p party it's yeah. about policy yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not about sitting on one side or the other no, side right. Yeah, Cause, cause get it done. We're, we're going we're to transition, and this is this is the world. This is the world's Australia's biggest business opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about employment, about investment, about decarbonisation, yeah. then actually we need to empower our businesses. We this is where the products mm -hmm. come from. This is where the workforce comes from. Mm -hmm. We're transitioning each in Australia one household at a time. Yeah, indeed, right? and you can't do it all at once. And that's that is something that I've recognised with you, like you take on a project at a time. Like recently you guys did a JV with master electricians mm -hmm. to take over the accreditation, mm -hmm. the SAA. Now, how's that, how, how has that been going? That's about a year old now. Yeah, so, so we, we kicked off in February. Um, uh, so, so we're tracking, you know, and that was a big logistical, um, mm -hmm. you know, project because under the law, we had to have it up and running within three months of being announced. And they couldn't, they couldn't let us do any work or tell us that we'd been announced until we were announced. Mm. So we had three months to stand it up. And during the transition period, we were, we were, we were processing 600 applications per day. Now, the CEC probably never processed 600 applications a month, yeah. right? <laughs> right? And yeah. so that, that condensed time, mm. I'm, I'm hugely proud. Now, 
Did it go completely without a hitch? It did not, right? Mm -hmm. It was a complex and large project, mm -hmm. but it went pretty well. I think, and, yeah, it went, it went as well as it could have, um, considering there may have been a few hiccups, but it was, yeah, very, very smooth. And, and the big change is this. We've made it a three-year process. Mm. So you pay your money for three years and you don't have to make eye contact on that part for another three years, right? It's a bit like your driver's license, right? right? Yeah. Or your electrician's mm. license, right? You don't have to do it every year. Now, you still have to do the CPD points to stay current, but that's something you should be doing in the background that's anyway. Right. So and just, you've made that super easy. And, and, and try, to, try to take the administrative load off. You know, there, there would not be brain surgeons in Australia that are more highly regulated than our mm, solar and mm. battery installers. Yeah. We've got to, we've got to come on, some yeah, co yeah. common sense, clearly, right? So, there, you know, we, we are moving into this whole period of electrification, like everything within the home and business, we're trying to shift away from different types of, of power sources and electrify. And, you know, we've, we've heard from electricians that, because there's always a breakdown between the person that sells the system and the person that installs the system. And some electricians think they should be the only ones selling. Well, if that's the case, we're never going to get to a renewable energy target. We'd lose so many sales. So what do we got to do to educate the salespeople? Like n New Energy Training Within Supply Partners has a certified consultant and site survey course so that we can educate those salespeople that are going into people's homes and selling them because they're not just going, hey, look, you, you're, you use this much kilowatt hours, the solar system's gonna do this, here's your return on investment, Bob's your uncle. Now it's, and now we got a, an inverter on there and we gotta put a battery. Well, where can we put a battery? What are you gonna use that battery for? All these things. Totally, so f first, huge congratulations to the supply partners, right? You've identified the weak link in the solar story because the installer gets there, they're very professional, but they don't know what the, what the customer's been told, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. you get some, some salesperson who's never worked in solar in their life. Yeah. So we see exploitation of vulnerable people, right? Huge inflation, you know, these mm -hmm. old pensioners and they're yeah. like, oh, here's a, it'll cost you 20K for your five kilowatt system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the worst story I heard was, it was, a, was a salesperson saying, well, actually, on a, when you get a full moon, you mm -hmm. will get some reflection. You'll definitely get some production <laughs> off that. You yeah. know? Like, yeah. it's, just, it's just crap, right? I bought those panels. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't you bought work. from that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so, and so, so, so supply partners actually, actually training courses for salespeople, for retailers, yeah. hugely important. Mm. But your second point is also important. This is about the transition of the whole energy system, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about also understanding sizing your battery appropriately. Are you going to use it for just your own needs or are you going to use it as a VPP? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about your heat pump for your hot water and your duction mm -hmm. cooktop? What about your air conditioning load? What about the EV that you're going to buy in six months' mm -hmm. time? And so the orchestration mm -hmm. and bring it all together. So, so actually, in my view... It is the solar retailers and installers that are our climate heroes, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. These people need to be recognised for the fantastic work they do. Agreed. The reason mm -hmm. I'm here is because I am shit scared about climate change, mm -hmm, right? I think yeah. things are, I think things are way worse than than uh, than we're being told, and I think we're we're in for a bumpy ride. It is only industry at scale. That can actually make the difference. Agreed, hundred percent. And so, and so, I, I just say, you know, good on you to everyone in this mm -hmm. industry. Um, but it also means we've got to upskill because we want to. We want to not just reduce your power bill. We want to basically get rid of your gas bill totally. and your petrol bill mm -hmm. all in one direction. So mm. it's great news for our industry because people have long-term customers that, that, that trust them and rely on them. You can now go back and mine that to say, well, what about all these other services? What about EV charging? What mm -hmm. about the battery right. you know, going on, right? As the economics change, that whole yeah. opportunity opens up. We have a huge, huge future in front of us. Oh, man, there's so much value in personal information. Um, that's, that's what I still don't understand is that those who are the climate deniers mean surely you like saving money e even if you take the the environment aside like <laughs> don't you like not paying for petrol don't you want to get a like almost no electricity bill like how, how can you be against the idea of that yeah, and yeah. that's why i love it right yeah. because it's an economic argument mm. and we save the planet as a th yeah. th free yeah. bonus takeaway right yeah, it's like, like fantastic yeah. so you know stay on the economics that's absolutely great mm. completely agree in the spirit of you continuing wanting to get things done which mm. is great Recently, I got an email from the Smart Energy Council looking to give me objection, give you objections for how the CEC has has handled the whole approved product list. So is and you've put in a tender to the CER to take this over. 
Can you give us an update on that? Yeah, look, pr- probably the, the red hot issue that I get mm. bailed up at every solar event is mm. someone complaining about the CEC product listing process. And the complaints are it takes way too long. Mm-hmm. It is way too complicated and it, it in turn costs us a lot of money because it's not the $5,000 fee, right, to get your, your, no. your inverters listed. It's the fact that it's going to take them 12 weeks minimum to look at it, yeah. right? Yeah. And exactly. then I've heard stories where people have been held out of the market for six months, seven months, 12 months, mm-hmm. right? And so the cost of their business is in that time, I could have shipped 20 containers to Australia and the cost of my business is $2.5 million, mm-hmm. right? And what was happening is the CEC takes in the fees, mm-hmm. but they don't resource the program. So it's yeah. one or two people. So you call them up and say, well, what about, you know, when's that going to happen? Oh, that person's sick. That pe- person's on leave. I know. That person left. That person. That person. So you have one yeah. person. That in, person, in right? Yeah. And so what we did is, is you know, because it's about a service to industry. Mm-hmm. And so we went to everyone and said, well, what does, it, what does a, a really good functioning Mm-hmm. service look like properly resourced so we actually designed something that had mm-hmm. 18 staff because if we can give people a- approvals in three weeks and four weeks right then the cost of doing business goes down yeah. and that reduces costs to the consumer and actually everybody wins in that process mm-hmm. yeah and it's not it's not even an integrity thing surrounding the safety of of it's just the the process. It's, it's, well, it's, it's already someone's already done a test of the products and got a certificate. Yeah. It's basically a process to say, is this a valid certificate? Yeah. Does it cover the right things? <laughs> exactly. Does it meet Australian standards? And, right. And see, the the manufacturers that we're dealing with now, um, they can move very quickly. I was on the phone to a manufacturer this morning talking about a change in the AS four triple seven point one standard, and I said, hey. If you can make this alteration to a product, this is going to be so much better for for business. Uh, Are you considering it? And they said, yes, we're considering it, but it's going to take us probably until the end of the year before we can implement it. And I said, why is that? Surely it's just a a small change. And they said, yeah, look, no problem. We've we've sorted our part. The hardware is very, very easy to change, but it's the CC listing. So the, the, oh. the, the, the other yeah. the other point is is they're actually making policy decisions. So you remember there was a change to to panel labeling. Oh yeah, right. Mm-hmm. The tests were basically exactly the same. Yeah, but the yeah. panel label had to be had to be updated. Now this is something that could have actually crashed the entire industry, mm-hmm. and particularly people like yourselves who are holding stock, distributing stock, people who have done contracts on stock, diabolically bad. Mm, yeah. and, and, and the CEC wouldn't move on it. It was only when we brought huge pressure through the government, through the CER and the industry mm. that they made any concession at all. So, so again, it's about you know, who you're working for, what's the service you're providing. Mm-hmm. And, and look, I, I've spent a, a, you know, a, a decade mm-hmm. more, 16, 17 years, I've been very diplomatic about this stuff, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But, but enough's enough, yeah. you know, and that's really that's, – and, mm-hmm. and so the call out was when I talk to the CR about this and I talk about the delays, for example, and other things, and the CR said, well, we've never heard of that. Mm. And so if you don't tell the CR, yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't know, right? Yeah. And so my call out was if, if you've had a problem – Right, this cost you money. Mm-hmm. Please tell the CER. Right, they're making the decision because if you don't, then we're just going to continue to get what we've always had. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, th- I think the big problem in our industry, and we've seen this, is everyone expects that somebody else will solve the issue. Yeah. Um, so that's where kind of we've taken lead. We've identified issues um, on a on a few occasions now, um, and we've raised it to you, and you've jumped straight on it. But yeah, the the feedback from installers and other companies is, oh look, someone else will sort it out. And and kudos to supply partners. You know, you are one of our lead members. Lead membership is the top tier. Right. Mm-hmm. And you, so you give us resources. But my call out to the whole industry is swing in behind us. Mm-hmm. We're a bit like an insurance policy. You wouldn't go on your roof if you didn't have insurance, right? Yeah. Well, you shouldn't be in the industry if you don't have an insurance policy because mm-hmm. you know when something really happens, yeah. we're going to do something about it. Um, a, a good example, I was visiting a, a retailer the other day and I was talking to the, the CEO of the, the retailer and he, and he was telling me his frustrations about this particular standard and how it's crazy and, and he rattled it all off and I said, look, I completely agree with you. And he said, I'm, I'm getting nowhere talking to Standards Australia. I said, you remember the Smart Energy Council? And he said, no. And then I gave him all these examples of the inbuilt DC isolator issue, um, oversizing of current. Um, there was the DC cable issue. There are so many issues that when you've gotten involved, yes, you didn't necessarily implement the fix, but you were the conduit that led to the fix. So get on to the council. Totally. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so, you know, yeah. to, to manufacturers, to, to retailers, definitely join as a member. But we've got another program which people might be interested in. Mm-hmm. That is a smart installer program. Yeah. So this is for installers. And guess what? 
It's entirely free of it's charge, free now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and what we do is we'll give you access to all of the standards: four triple seven, five zero double three, uh, five five three four nine. You know the battery standard, yeah, um, yeah. and and, um, uh, and and all free of charge. If you went and tried to buy them from Standards Australia, mm-hmm. it's probably about seven thousand dollars you'd need to invest. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got all the training modules there that are mm-hmm. free of charge, and we're to create a community, a peer to peer community, where people can actually you know, um, mentor new people into the industry and, and solve technical problems together. So um, mm. so get on board. Yeah. No, we went on last week yeah. to download yeah, yeah, the yeah, new yeah. 4777. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other webinar that you gave uh, not, not too long ago was an update on the uh, New South Wales battery scheme that's coming up, which is awesome. I really enjoyed that podcast or that, that webinar. How important is energy storage going to be for us hitting these targets? Energy storage is everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So we already see that energy is, so solar is just carving out the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. So that, so the the value of energy in the middle of the day is falling rapidly because we've got so much rooftop solar, Mm -hmm. solar farms piling in, right? That's great, but it doesn't solve the problem 6 p.m. till 9 p.m., which is the evening peak. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and that, you know, really hard. So it's like the duck, right? Well, mm-hmm. with energy storage, you time shift from 2 in the afternoon to 8 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And what you do is you take the cheapest electricity and you yeah. replace the most expensive electricity. Mm-hmm. And in doing that together, we cut the head off the duck, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it brings down electricity prices, not just for someone who has a battery, but for Everybody for the whole community. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's why we need a national battery booster rebate scheme. And you took the words right out of my mouth, John. <laughs> like, like, and, and, and I can tell you that, that we are, we've been talking in detail with the federal government. So people wouldn't know the role that we played in the lead up to the last federal budget. Remember, there was $23 billion for renewables, for critical minerals. Now, when we talk about critical minerals, mm-hmm. what we're actually talking about is the world's biggest solar and wind farms you've ever seen, right? right? The one the one in the Pilbara will be 1,600 wind turbines wow. and 73 square kilometres of solar panels mm. because that's the energy that's going to be needed to process iron ore. Yeah. And so we don't, oh, yeah. just, we don't just send dirt overseas, but mm-hmm. we send green iron pellets, right? Yeah. We, we actually process it here. Um, so, so and, and we got close with the federal government. We were mm-hmm. talking about green iron, about battery booster. Um, I think we're, we're pushing on, on an open door. I'm very hopeful of, of having something nationally. Yeah. Um, and, and that'll really be the work of the Smart Energy Council to deliver that. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, um, it, it, it's so needed, hey? Like, mm-hmm. because the STCs are slowly dwindling down, as well as the LGCs, there needs to be incentive. And the, b- the batteries are just so important. Like the solar scheme has, or the SDCs have done what it needed to do. Yep. It brought right to the to scale. The, it brought it to scale. It's cheap. It's affordable. Now we need to do the same thing with batteries. I, I, th- I think better education is needed. So just circling back to our talk about electrifying the home and, and, and offering a smart solution. If you go onto um, social media and you look at any post relating to renewable energy or solar, there's a lot of negativity from mums and dads who don't understand solar, who think solar is a scam. I don't get paid money for them. Um, solar I send back to the grid. And talking to a lot of electricians, a lot of electricians don't understand the current state of affairs with the cost of electricity at different times of the day. So if if we can educate them, explain why it is, how it is, if they can educate the mums and dads mm-hmm. and then start offering solutions that solve this, then hopefully we can overcome a lot of that that negativity and objections at the end user level. So so the, the, the next program we're going to have is, is really our Solar Heroes program. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, we're, you know, we're going we're to focus on the industry, but we also want to focus, focus on customers, yeah. telling their story. What was the reality before they got solar and batteries, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And what's the reality afterwards, right? Because it's that it's that real world story that mm-hmm. kind of convinced people. It's not a it's not a company trying to sell something. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of a neighbour telling them about about how that went. So yeah, yeah. the other thing I, I think you know, Wade and Andrew, that that just strikes me. I've spent a bit of time in China this year, mm-hmm. particularly looking at electric vehicle infrastructure. Oh wow! And Isn't and it something China. Mm-hmm today owns the vehicle industry globally. Mm-hmm. It's just the rest of the world don't know about it yet. Yeah. When, when I went to Snack, I came back and I told Andrew, I was like, one out of every two cars was electric. It was crazy. Unbelievable, yeah. right? Yeah. On the streets of say So 50% of all new vehicle sales in China mm-hmm. today, EVs, wow. right? Yeah. These are brands. And they're nice looking And that, too. they are really nice, right? Mm-hmm. And really well priced. Well, think of the scale. Like oh, we're in scale. Shanghai, there's more people in Shanghai than all of Australia. That's and half right. the cars on the road were EVs. Mm-hmm. 
So that's that that, that that's insane. It. Proof point right there. Yeah. And so mm. and so what's going to happen in the next year in Australia? Thirty new models are coming to market. A whole bunch of brands that people have never heard of. Mm-hmm. And 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 my prediction by by twenty twenty eight twenty nine. The incumbent, particularly the Japanese, who didn't shift, like the Europeans shifted, right? Mm. The Japanese did not. Um, Toyota, Nissan, uh, Mazda, uh, Honda, they're going to be in real strife. Yeah, you mm. know, the, the, uh, there's a new wave now. That means people can have EVs in their in their in their uh, home. Yeah, they're also going to have an EV at work. And so an employer who can put on solar and EV charging, what a great perk for, for employees. Mm-hmm. They can basically provide the energy free of charge, take it home, you power your house at night time with the energy you got from work. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a thing of beauty. That's very exciting. Right? <laughs> and even play on the wholesale market. Oh, it? absolutely. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. It'd be an accountant's nightmare trying to calculate the fringe benefits off that yeah. system. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think like talking to a lot of installers as well who, who come through, we've seen a lot of uh, solar sales companies just deck out their sales team fleets with Teslas or BYDs, but talking to a lot of people, I'm like, are you going to switch to EV? And they said, we're holding off on, on the ute. And there's a lot of utes that are going to be entering the market in the next yeah. 12 months. So that, that'll shift things as yeah. well. Well, yeah, gone are the days of the only EVs we see are Teslas. Now we see BYDs and, you know, some other smaller Polestar, ones yeah, around. Yeah. But it's going to just be littered. I, with, I tell, mm. tell you the one that blew my mind, and that's a company called Neo company people might not have heard of in mm-hmm. China. It's a startup company. They just do EVs. Um, and uh, uh, um, the, unbelievable. So these are probably the best EVs available in the world. Mm-hmm. We went to their production facility and it's basically robots as far as the eye can see. And I'm talking about kilometres wow. right, yeah. of yeah. these robots, right? Now, those robots, they look like giant crabs working on a car at one mm-hmm. time. They're fed by middle-sized robots. Yep that are in turn fed by little baby robots, right? It was like, I mean, I, I, I was a child in 1977, right, watching <laughs> yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. It was like Star Wars come, come to life. Yeah. There's yeah. a human being about every 200 square metres and the job of the human being is to make sure that no one touches the robots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw the exact same thing in a PV manufacturing facility. I was like... Where are all the humans? Well, where the people mm-hmm. are gone. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Little mm-hmm. little pallet jacks with lasers on that's them, it. riding around. That's it's it. It's just mind blowing. It is mind blowing. It? it totally is. You know. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. Um, X Peng, did you see one of X Peng? X Peng, really? Uh, the the Zika. You know. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch, of, and these are cars. I would I'd hop into every day of the week. Oh, like I'd be gorgeous. I'd be just super pleased to hop mm-hmm. into oh, some of those cars. And, so. and how quiet are the streets? Oh. It was mind blowing. Well, I don't know if you saw a little vi- little video on online of a, of a driverless taxi in Wuhan. Mm-hmm. I called it on an app. Hop in the back. There is nobody in the front row, no. right? So there's no driver at all. Mm-hmm. There are 400 of them going around. You commercially, you just get it. You can, anyone can get it, right? Yeah. Wow. And it took me to my restaurant. And and it did it fully automated. And you can imagine Chinese traffic at 5 p.m., right? There are no lane rules. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so you could see the car kind of making this in, oh, I reckon there's a gap over there. And then someone yeah. would cut it off and like, oh, crap, that's gone. Yeah. You actually, you could feel it thinking. Yeah, oh, yeah. You feel right. it that's thinking. kind of scary. I just hope it didn't <laughs> ask for a tip at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, In fact, that, yeah. something I noted is that they actually make a little noise, tsh, tsh, because – because there's no driver, mm-hmm. it has to warn people that actually yeah. oh, I'm a, I'm a yeah. vehicle, right? Because otherwise you could, sure. you could step in front of it. But the only thing I found was people were really, really rude because mm. cutting off a, a robot, who cares, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Cutting off a yeah. human being, oh, I kind of feel a bit bad about that. So They're sitting there sticking their finger out the window and it's like, I'm a robot. Yeah, I'm a robot. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robot. Yeah. There's yeah. no yeah. road yeah. rage yeah. here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Until someone hacks it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only thing that's going to save my Tesla stock is this autonomous driving and the auto taxis or whatever that they're creating, right? Like, and, mm-hmm. and you can imagine a, f- a future where the, where, where the vehicles are talking to each other. So that knows exactly. that mm-hmm. this vehicle yep. is going there. So they'll link up. They can go on the express line because they know what the destination mm-hmm. of every other vehicle. They know their future movements, right? Remember yeah. the movie Demolition Man? Yeah. With Sylvester Stallone? Yeah. And how all the vehicles just did yeah, that? That's right. That's I it. always wanted that's it. to be alive that's when it. that happened that's and right. it's going to happen. I know it. Yeah. It's so cool to be a member of this industry. Like renewable energy is just so awesome. And, you know, considering my like number one job in this world being a father mm. and I... You know, my kids, I'm, we're constantly having conversations with them of what jobs are still going to be around mm-hmm. in 20 years mm-hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. saw billboards of renewable energy on the way into work today, and I was just like, this is an industry where you can actually forecast. You can see 30, 40, 50 years down the road where it's going to be here. 
it's mm-hmm. going to be something that we all need for generations to come. So it's, it's awesome and it's an honor to do business in this industry. How are you feeling about employment opportunities right now? within this industry. Re- well, really worried, right? So in the short term, we've actually had we've actually had the biggest dip in the solar industry that we've seen, actually the, the lowest point since 2017. Mm-hmm. I had a look at the figures over the weekend, right? Mm-hmm. So the latest um, uh, figures from the clean energy regulator mm-hmm. on the creation of STCs, um, you know, shows that, you know, that, that we've taken a dip. So first, I'm worried about people for their immediate jobs, right? Yeah, yeah. And their immediate, you know, to, to keep the, the company going and so forth. Mm-hmm. But longer term, I'm also worried because we, we're going to need everybody because mm-hmm. we need everything everywhere, all at once, again and again and again, yeah, right? Yeah. And that means we've got to attract young people into our industry. We've got, be- got to do better in terms of inclusion and diversity. We've got to get more women in yeah. into our industry. 2% of yeah. electricians are female in this country. Right, that's not good enough, mm-hmm. you know. And so we've got we're going to get all people involved. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a huge opportunity for Australia because we're at that, we're ahead of the curve in home electrification. Indeed. We're going to get skills and knowledge that are going to have a global application. So thinking about Australian companies actually going and colonising other parts of the world yeah. to yeah. bring that expertise, I think it's an absolutely awesome future. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, there is no business certainty without political certainty. Mm. How do you feel? And do you have any fear about if there's a shift in government? How do you feel that they're doing right now and if there is a shift? I'm really scared. Yeah. And the thing that we need in Australia is this. We need all politicians, all political parties to agree that this is a massive business opportunity, mm-hmm. a huge in- employment opportunity. You put solar and batteries in, you're going to slash your cost of living. You worry about cost of living? Mm-hmm. You know, if you do gas, get ready, gas bill, your petrol bill and your electricity bill, Mm -hmm. we can give people back $5,000 a year into the household budget, Mm -hmm. right? Now, what could be more valuable than that, right? But to have people who are still controlled by the fossil fuel industry, right, the vested interests, Mm -hmm. is, is, is a travesty for Australia's future, right, and for our young people. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the critical thing we need we need all politicians. It, you know, in the UK, there is no left and right on this stuff. They yeah. all agree that this is the future and the opportunity. That's yeah. what we need desperately in Australia yeah. because we play this game. It's a bit like Trumpism, right? You know, Trump comes back and goes, oh, crikey, we go backwards for another mm-hmm. four years, right? Well, that, we can't have that. We've got to actually have no matter who's in power. Mm-hmm. Got, but at the moment, that's not the case. It really worries me. Mm-hmm. And the nuclear debate worries me. And it's because the debate goes like this. Mm-hmm. Nuclear is awesome. In 2040, it's going to ride over the hill and save us all, right? It is a thing of beauty. So therefore, we can keep burning as much yeah, coal yeah. and gas as, as humanly possible between now and then. We don't have to worry about renewables, mm. right? We don't have to worry about batteries, mm. right? We could just solve it, right? Frog shit. Yeah. Frog shit, <laughs> right? And so, and so that, mm. that is a, that's, that's a danger. And so um, there are vested interests that want to shut us down. We know it. We've lived it for more than a decade. They are still there. They still want to shut us down. It's a big problem. Yeah. So what is the current government that you know of doing um, to, I guess, protect some of the measures that they've put in place now? Should there be a change in government? Well, you know, um, a, a bunch of things are being legislated and the way that you craft the laws mean that it can be very difficult that, for them to be undone. Mm-hmm. But nothing is in, um, poss- impossible to be okay. undone. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember Tony Abbott? He tried to actually abolish the renewable energy target. That would have meant mm. all support for rooftop solar, the SRS, gone. Yeah. LGCs, the large scale scheme, gone, right? That was their agenda. That has not changed. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really worried. And, and I despair because our, our industry is probably naturally conservative. It's probably naturally rightward you know, leaning, right? Because we are small mm. businesses. We're, we're contractors. Uh, and, so, and so the fact that they can't see that actually this is a huge business opportunity, mm. it just it, – it, it drives me to despair. Yeah. I, I do remember that time really well because I'd been in solar for maybe six or seven years um, and then all of that was was in the media and it actually caused me to, I guess, exit the solar industry because I was so nervous about my employment riding upon what decisions the, the government were making. So I exited. I went and worked for a building material supplier for about six months and then f- thought, hey, this is super boring plywood hasn't changed in the last 100 <laughs> years um, and I very quickly came back to solar. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But n- nothing is inevitable, yeah. yeah. you know, and so you've got to put your, your shoulder to the wheel if you mm-hmm. want to. John, there's a 
buzzword going around called social licensing. Can mm. you touch on that? What yeah, it means? I, I, I totally can. Yeah. So th- this is actually a, a, a campaign that's really being weaponized by the National Party in particular, mm-hmm. and they're focusing on on regional, on farmers and regional communities to weaponize renewable energy objections. So, so this is about getting local communities to say, we say no to new transmission lines. We say no to solar farms. We say no to wind farms. And so, because if you don't have the social license, the support of those local communities, mm-hmm. then you are going to really run into, in, mm-hmm. into problems and objections. So I'm not saying that every uh, wind farm or solar farm has been a model of community engagement. It has not, right? Yeah. And we collectively must do much better. Mm-hmm. We've also got to do better in terms of benefit sharing. Right, so wouldn't Correct. it be great if, if we let the local communities either take an investment stake or give them give them a, a discount mm-hmm. on their power bill, right? So that they're actually they're, they're, we're all tied together, right? Yeah. The incentives are aligned. Mm-hmm. The problem is that there are not good faith actors. So I'll give you an op, a, 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 an example in New South Wales. If you get fifty objections to your solar farm in New South Wales, it automatically goes through to this planning review year-long, couple of year-long process, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, recently there was an objection. There were 35 objections made, Mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, uh, 30 of them were from people who were negative and were for people who didn't live in the the area. So anybody could... Peter Pumpkin writes in and goes, I hate this solar farm, right? Mm-hmm. And Peter, Peter's only got 29 other mates, right? Yep. They do it every time. Mm-hmm. And then the five other ones were basically supportive of the project. So so they're gaming the rules. They're actually mm-hmm. weaponizing this. Mm-hmm. You see the anti-renewables rally in Parliament House, you know, about six months ago. Yeah. This is going to be a big thing in the election. And so they're trying to, to – to, it's the new frontier. How do you keep selling gas and coal? You, you carve the heart out of the renewable transition. Mm-hmm. Oof. I, I think your Solar Heroes program should assist with this as well because if, if you're only engaging with the community at the time of proposing one of these projects, people are going to say, you're only just telling us what, what we want to hear. But if, but if you can educate the, um, Australia as a whole before these projects come to be, then, then we can assist with that. Perfect example, um, a neighbour complaining about a new solar panel system. Oh, the reflection, this is terrible. Get it off your roof like I'm, I'm going to complain. Do you know that the reflectivity of a solar panel is much less than the reflectivity of a colour bond roof? Yeah. Like just little things like that. If we can get the education out there, it'll only help. Couldn't, so. couldn't agree more. Designed yeah. to suck in sunlight, right? Yeah. Not yeah. to reflect it yeah, back. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. Worst, yeah. worst design solar panel ever if yeah, that's, that's what it's right, doing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You've also been quite vocal about adding more value to our resources before we ship them yeah. away, right? Like yeah. how's that been – Going well, it, going extremely well, but 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 I but I fear that the story still is not being told to the general public, mm-hmm. and the story is pretty simple, right? It's super simple. Our, our, our economy relies on gas exports, coal exports, and iron ore exports, right? That's where that's where the, the budget gets funded from, yep. right? And and you know, in terms of, of iron ore and other things, now the whole world is transitioning. In the future, they're not going to be buying our coal, mm. they're not going to be buying our gas. Mm-hmm. And they're going to be buying iron ore, but only iron ore that can be processed with zero carbon inputs. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so structurally, if Australia does not shift now, in 15 or 20 years' time, we're done. Yeah. Remember, remember the, the, the economy of Argentina, right? In the 1950s was a big deal. They were like, ah, mm-hmm. oh, Argentina is like Australia. And they really were, like mm-hmm. a big advanced economy. Today, you know, they're completely left behind. Yeah, yeah. These things can change. They are not inevitable. And so if you don't plan for the change, mm-hmm. so that means let's not dig up dirt and send it overseas where 98% of it is waste and somebody else uses coal mm-hmm. to turn it into iron and then steel. Let's use the world's cheapest and cleanest electricity, renewable energy from Queensland, mm-hmm. from Western Australia, from mm-hmm. South Australia, to process so that we're actually sending embedded sunshine and wind that's the energy we're going to use, right? Yeah, These yeah. other countries that don't have the, the renewable resources we have, right, mm. they can actually buy a zero carbon input. So you think about the automotive sector in China or in Europe, right, mm-hmm. or in or the United States. They might be paying an extra $200 for green steel as opposed to carbon intensive steel. And that's a car, that's about 11% of world emissions, steel mm. production, right? Mm. Uh, $200 more. Well, I, I'd pay an extra 200 bucks on a car that, that was completely carbon free. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, know? yeah. That's the opportunity for Australia. Yeah. And so we want heavy industry. We want blue collar jobs. We want mining mm-hmm. done in the right way. We want that and we can have it. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to pivot to a new future. Mm-hmm. That's... That's actually probably a great place to uh, to finish off. Hey, that was that was perfect. Well said, um, John. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Yeah.
And and let me just shout out, Wade, Andrew, you know, you guys, um, this type of engagement, talking to people and bringing these issues is at the front line of what we do. Thank you. Thank you to supply partners. Um, you know, investing in this is really important. And, uh, and thank you to all your listeners and everyone else who's involved in the industry as well. Thank, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And for those of you listening, thank you. We hope you got some value out of this and we'll, we'll talk to you next time. 